There's a land that is fairer than day And by faith we can see it afar For the Father waits over the way To prepare a some dwelling place there And in the sweet by and by We shall see on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore Shall sing on that beautiful song the melodious songs of the blessed, and our spirit shall sorrow no more. And not a sigh for the blessings of rest, and in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet. Shall meet on that beautiful shore. To our bountiful Father above, we will offer a tribute of praise for the glorious gift of His love and the blessings that hallow our days. And in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful Sure. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Oh, in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Oh, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. Prepare. Prepare. Ye the way of the Lord Prepare Are ye Christians? Prepare Are ye sinners? Prepare Ye the way of the Lord
made for battle, Lord. Cause we dance, we dance, and we shout, and we shout. And we lift up our voice, let your kingdom come down, and we dance, we dance, and we shout, and we shout. We lift up our voice, let your kingdom come down, and we dance, we dance, and we shout. Shine. 
out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you none like you our god is greater our god is stronger god you are higher than any other our god is healer awesome and power our god our god stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand against oh if our God is for us then who could ever stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand against
Bible says in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, it says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me. I'm going to be watching what he will say unto me. Amen. God. And what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me. So it's telling you who is listening to speak to him. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. I want you to remember verse 3 because uh, I'm going to be talking in a few minutes about an appointed time. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry or though though it's a long time in coming, wait for it because it will uh, surely come it will not tarry. And behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Everybody say that with me. The just shall live by faith. Let's say that again. The just shall live by faith. Let us all pray together. Father, as we humbly come into your presence now, God, we ask that you would add your blessings to the reading of the Bible. We pray, God, that you would help us so that we could help this church. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God, that your will would be done here today. Amen. If somebody's lost, have mercy on that sacrifice. Uh, speak to that heart and let them know, God, uh, amen, that we're, we're, we're nearing the end without a doubt, God, from a biblical perspective. And I pray today uh, that you would drive back every hindrance out of this service uh, and let the glorious light of the gospel of Christ uh, go forth in a great and a mighty way. And we'll never fail to praise you for it all uh, in Jesus' name. And let the church of the living God shout amen. While you're being seated now all over the building, I want to talk a little while about verse 3. Actually, I'm going to talk about all the verses, but especially verse 3 is where we want to pull and take for a title out of our text. The Bible says, at the appointed time it will speak. Amen. At the appointed time it will speak. And there's a lot of things, amen, that I'd like to talk about today, but by God's help, I want to address from this passage of passage of strength scripture that we have just read to you, amen, upon the book of this message. First of all, amen, that, 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 that God's laid this on my heart. In verse 1, amen, the Bible tells us uh, this prophet Habakkuk, he was interested in, in what God had to say. Well, I want to tell you sadly, there's a lot of people today, uh, there's not, they, they're not really interested in what God has got to say. They say, don't preach to me, preacher. And they're sort of like the ones in Romans chapter 1 when the Bible says that they don't like to retain God in their knowledge. But I want to tell you something. Whether you want to think about God or not, God is real. Amen. And you better believe that with me. Whether you want to think about living and dying in hell and eternity. Amen. In heaven, I want to tell you, we're all going to face it. It's like the song they just sung. Prepare to meet thy God. Amen. We're everyone that's under the sound of my voice today on a head on collision course with Jesus Christ, uh, the one that's got eyes of fire, amen, the one when he spake, uh, his voice sounded like many waters, uh, the one that John said, when I saw him, uh, I fell at his feet as though I, he, I were dead, uh, and he laid his right hand upon me and said, fear not, uh, you may be living in fear, but I'm telling you uh, that you can get the one in your heart that said, fear not, uh, I am the first and I'm the last, uh, I'm he that liveth and was dead and behold I'm alive forevermore and I've got the keys to hell and of death. God's got the keys to your destiny. He's got the keys to your eternity. He's got the keys to get you out of the pit. Amen. If you believe it shout amen. So here is what I want you to see. Habakkuk was interested in what God was saying. In Habakkuk 2 and verse 1 the Bible says I will watch to see what he will say unto me. In other words, he knew that the Lord had a message for him. And then in verse 2, we learn that God, amen, sent a vision to Habakkuk. And he said, this vision, when you get it, I want you to write it on tables of 
stone and the reason that I want you to write it, he said, he said I, I, I want the one that reads the message that I've got that, I, that, that I'm going to share with you so you can share with them, amen, so that he, the one that reads it will run or he can run. In other words, he was saying something is going to happen and you're going to need to be able to escape what's going to happen uh, but, and, 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 the, and what's going to happen is going to be written down. Amen. And when you read it, uh, there's a way to get out of it. So what he's saying is you're going to be able to escape what's coming. Uh, I want to tell you something. There's something coming. Uh, there's not only something coming, uh, but there's someone that's coming uh, and his name is Jesus Christ. Christ, the son of the living God, amen. And the Bible said when he comes, they're gonna run to the rocks and to the mountains and they're gonna cry out, fall on us and hide us from the him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Thank God forever. But let me tell you something. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter two, verse one and two, the writer says this, amen, it says, it asked a question actually it says amen it says who shall escape the things that shall come upon this world who shall how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and then then it came through the apostles and the prophets and others to us but let's go on the Bible says in a back of two and two it says write the message and make it plain. Well, I want to tell you something. God's word has always been plain. Amen. See, the devil wants you to think the Bible is, a, is it, it, you just can't understand it. I, I've even been guilty of saying, man, I just can't understand it. But I'm going to tell you, when the Bible says you can understand it, uh, you can understand it. Amen. Doesn't matter what you say. The Bible tells us in, in Isaiah 35 and verse 8, it says, and, and a highway shall be there, and, and a way it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the way wayfaring man which is a traveler the wayfaring man though a fool a man shall not err therein it says if you ain't intelligent if you don't know enough to get in out of the rain, amen, you can understand uh, that there's a God in heaven, that he's coming again, and you better get ready to escape that awful day that Jesus said, uh, give him a praise offering, amen, that, that, that Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 21, uh, that there never was a time like it, uh, no, nor ever shall be again, and except those days be shortened. Uh, brother, if God didn't intervene, uh, man would totally self-destruct and annihilate himself. But God's going to step in. God's going to take care. God's going to take control. And you better believe that. Amen. And the Bible says in Psalms 119 verse 130, the entrance of thy word, which is the Bible, it giveth light and it giveth understanding to the simple. You can be a simple-minded person and understand what God is saying. Listen to what Paul said to the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29, he said, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the, 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 the wise. Amen. God just messes people up, church. Jesus did it when he come. He'd go in a temple, amen. He'd turn the money changers' tables over. He'd run them out of there with a whip. Amen. Thank God forever. I'm going to tell you something. We're serving a God that likes to disrupt the ways of men so that he can get their hearts turned to the ways of God. And the Bible says that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. Amen. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen and yea things which are not. God's got some stuff that you we don't even know about and things that are not to bring to naught the things that are are and, and the reason that he's done this that no flesh that no flesh shall glory in his presence. Amen. That's just the truth about it. Finally God tells Habakkuk in verse 3 of chapter 2 he said the vision is yet for an appointed time. Everybody say appointed time. 
I'm going to tell you, there ain't no preacher can write a book and tell you when Jesus is coming. The Bible said, Jesus said that no man knoweth the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. But you know what Jesus said? He said there's going to be some signs or indicators of when I am come, the general time frame. And and the thing about prophecy, church, it's got this uncanny ability of unfolding and fulfilling itself right before our very eyes and let's not even realize it. That's the God's truth. All the goofy, crazy insane stuff that's going on in the world today. I want to tell you right now, the Hebrew prophets and Jesus Christ himself spoke about it a long time ago. And I want to tell you something. It ain't a going according to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. It's not a going according to Putin or Chi or any of the other leaders of the world. But I come here today to declare unto you it's going by the book. Amen. It's going by the book and it's unfolding right before our very eyes and this man of God when he seen the vision of the coming of the son of God he said he said the vision amen God spoke to this prophet and he said the vision is for an appointed time there is an appointed time yonder in eternity that the father is going to look over at the son and he's going to say son go bring my children home hallelujah and we're going to leave here in a moment uh, in a twinkling of an eye thank God uh, and we're going to meet him in the clouds and so shall we ever be with the Lord and the Bible says it's going to speak in the end God's appointed time of the coming of God's son it's going to speak in the end and he said though it tarry that word tarry means uh, though it is a long time coming he said wait for it because it will surely come and it will not tarry. And that means when the appointed time comes, it's going to happen and it ain't going to tarry any longer. So we see here that God has an appointment, uh, that God is a God of appointments and he will be on time. Uh, Amen. You see, sometimes appointments get changed. Uh, Just uh, a a month or so ago, uh, uh, little Annie was a, She had an appointment to see a doctor in Lexington. And that appointment was uh, the 17th of June, this past Friday. In the beginning, the appointment was for 9.15. And they called and they said, we need to move that up. And they moved it up to 12.15. And then they called another time. And they said, the doctor's going to be in in surgery that day. So we need to move it up again. And they moved it up to 3 p.m. that afternoon. But finally, amen, the appointment happened. And I'm telling you right now, amen, there's been religious groups that said Jesus was coming in 1914, but he didn't come. And then they said, well, we missed it. He's going to come in 1928, and he didn't show up. And then in the year 2000, all these preachers was hollering, Y2K, the computer's going to crash. The Mayan calendar doesn't go beyond that. Surely the Lord's are coming, but he didn't come. And here we are in 2022, and he ain't here yet, but I've got good news. He's coming, and though he tarries, wait on him, because in the end, he's going to speak, and he is never late on an appointment. He's never late on an appointment. I typed in... And my phone, the address of that facility, that medical facility. And you know what it said when I got into the outskirts and the, and the perimeter of the city limits of Lexington? Amen. It said, your arrival time is going to be in 28 minutes. Well, I'm going to tell you the truth of the matter is, yonder in heaven, I don't know when Jesus is coming. And I've got good news for you. You don't either. And, and when you don't know when, when you know something's going to happen, but you don't know when it's going to happen, the best thing you better do for yourself uh, is to get ready for it to happen because it's going to happen. Uh, and, and I'm going to tell you something yonder in glory. I don't know how it's set up up there, but I'm telling you right now, there, there's coming a day, there's coming an hour, there's coming a minute, and there's coming a second when the Son of the living God is going to be spoken to by the Father and he's going to say, go get your church. 
Go get your bride. The appointment time has come. Amen. And I pray that you're ready. So let's go on a little bit. Amen. God doesn't work according to our time schedule. He doesn't. He really doesn't. Peter knew this. That's why Peter said in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness. But the Lord is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. I'm going to tell you, don't, don't, don't get upset with me, but i just got to be blunt with you. If you go to hell, friend, you're going to go over the will of God to get there. You're going to trample underfoot the blood of the Son of God to go there. You're going to walk on the Bible, the Word of God in order to get there because God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. Amen. And that's just the truth. The Passion Translation says it really well in 2 Peter 3 and 9. It says this means that contrary to man's perspective, the Lord is not late with His promise to return. God ain't late, church. God knowed thousands of years ago exactly when He's coming. He, I'm going to tell you something. God knows you. You think you're in church today because you want to honor your father. I'm telling you right now, you're in church today because God wanted you to be here. That's why you're in church today. Amen. That's just God wanted you to hear this. And the Bible says that, that, God, that God is not late with his promise to return as some me, as, as, as so some measure lateness. But rather, his delay simply reveals his loving patience toward you. You know why you didn't get killed in that car wreck? It's because God's long-suffering wanted to give you a chance. You know why you didn't die of that drug overdose? I'm going to tell you why. Because God wanted to give you another chance. Because God wanted you to be here today. Amen. And it says, because he does not want any to perish but all to come to repentance now after saying all of that I want to talk just for a few more minutes on the subject taken from Habakkuk 2 and verse 3 where the Bible says at the appointed time at the appointed time it's going to speak but you know what I really think I think God is speaking right now I think that God is speaking to us right now through the signs that are in the heavens all the upheavals in nature and what is taking place on earth, amen, in current events. And I think, praise God, that he's speaking through, to us through all the social uh, weirdness and unrest that's in the society that we're living in. And all we hear about is going woke and the counterculture. Well, I want to tell you all, for 43 years, I've been in the counterculture. Amen. I got into the kingdom of light, which pulled me out of the darkness of the counterculture that I was reared in. Hallelujah. And my kingdom is not of this world, but is of another world. Amen. And I come here today to to tell you about that other world. When I was in school, I had to do an essay on a, on a, on a, on a, on a book, and this book was uh, called A Brave New World. Amen. And it was talking about ex, ex, extraterrestrials. And man, I, I, you wouldn't believe what I believed when I was a teenager. I mean, I, I entertained the thought of, and I'm not proud of this, of reincarnation and, uh, and, 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 uh, and little green men and, uh, and life on other planets. And then I got saved and I, I got a news flash. Uh, they, they want the government to reveal whether or not they've found uh, 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 little green men or extraterrestrials out there in Roswell. Well, New Mexico, hey, amen, and they're all in a big hoopla whether or not there's life out, out there. I want to tell you, church, there's life out there. God's out there. Heaven's out there. And wherever God is, there is life. And that's where we're going, church. And I want to tell you something. If there's other solar systems and planets with life on it, amen, the same God that we got is their God. Hallelujah. Because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen. He made it all. He hung the stars on nothing and he calls them all by name. And bless God, not one of them burns out without he lets it. But let's go on. Amen. In 2 Peter 3 verse 8 and 9, the Bible tells us in the message translation, don't overlook the obvious here, friends. I'm thinking a lot of people's overlooking the obvious. 
I mean, you can't, you can't even watch a Hallmark film without, without the, the, they bringing in the gays. And I've seen a news clip this morning. I don't hate them people. They probably probably a few drunks in here this morning, and, and, and I love you, man. Amen. But let me tell you something. Nobody gets offended if you preach about that's wrong to get drunk. And they probably, God forbid, but there may be some fornicators in here this morning. Nobody don't get mad at me for preaching against sex sin. But buddy, you start preaching about the, amen, men going with men and women with women, and you feel this spiritual t- attack come against you. Yeah. You don't love them, preacher. Yeah, I love them. Hey, man, uh, listen, I love my boys, but if they get out and get drunk, I don't approve of what they're doing. Hey, it ain't got nothing to do with love. It's got to do with right and wrong and what the Bible says. And I'm going to tell you, when the heavens and the earth passes away, the Bible is going to still be standing. Uh, and you better believe that with me. That's just the truth about it. But, but, but I want to tell you something here, church. Uh, hey, man, we're living in a sick time, and people think that, you, you, you know, that everything's all right. But listen, it's unfolding right before our eyes. And me, my wife and I was watching this movie. It's a Hallmark movie. It's a real good movie. Hey, you ever know, notice some Hallmark, Hallmark movies? I always give them a big kiss at the end of it. You ever notice that? Hey, Amen. Well, I didn't like that big kiss they got at the end of this. And that whole movie was an awesome movie. And at the end of it, this, this, this woman got married. But the problem was she got married to another woman. And I told my wife, I said, that's destroyed that whole movie. I don't even want to watch that film. But what they do, they ease it in. You see, if we turned all the lights off in this building right now, yeah, it would look really dark in here. But give you about two minutes and your pupils of your eyes will dilate to let in more light and it won't seem dark. You know what's wrong with our society because people ain't been taught the Bible and raised in church? Amen. They have got used to the dark. And see, you wouldn't even notice it being dark in here after a while. But then as soon as you walked outside and got exposed to the light, You just see how dark it is. I want to tell you something. Don't get used to the dark. We're living in a dark day and we're children of the light and we ought to be letting letting our light shine before men that they could see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. He said God's going to meet His appointment but let's go back to the message translation. It says don't overlook the obvious here, friends. It's obvious to me that we're living, the, the, the two generations that Jesus compared the one that be living when he comes was Noah and Lot. Noah's generation, read it in Genesis chapter 6, was corrupt, uh, and, and the imaginations of a man's heart was only evil com- continually, and the earth was filled with violence. Now you tell me that we ain't vi- uh, witnessing those three things. Crazy imaginations, corruption everywhere, And it's the most violent time that we've ever lived in. And I'm going to tell you all something that's a shocker. You know, when I went to high school, I had to ride that yellow dog to get there. But a lot of my buddies, they I'm telling you, I'm being honest with you, I ain't envious of them. I would have loved to have done it too. My dad just didn't have money. I I have buddies that drove Corvettes and Chevelles and Novas and and, and to uh, to, to, to school. And, and, And some of them that wasn't as fortunate as the Corvette Club... They drive no pickup truck. But there was something I noticed in high school in that pickup truck. It had, it had gun racks in the back of the window. And this is the truth. I can tell you I speak the truth. Half them trucks would have a gun in them, hanging on the rack for everybody to see. And I'm going to tell you something else. I guarantee you that there was 280 of us graduated that year. And I'm telling you what, I guarantee you that 99% of those boys had a pocket knife. Carried it right in the classroom. Nobody didn't frisk you down. And you know what I didn't see in those days? I never hear tell of a school shooting. I mean, they had guns in the parking lot. But they was for squirrels. Not for, listen, church, that ought to wake people up, buddy. We're living in a dark day, a crazy time. A friend of mine, uh, I, I got a message last week, don't y'all get scared and not coming to church now. But in Atlanta, a shooter went into a church, and I never did find out if anybody got killed, but he shot a bunch of people in church. That's just the truth, church. You, you never, listen, you never hear to that back 
in the 70s or the 80s. But look at us now. And you tell me that people better be paying attention to what's going on. Listen, there's a devil loose. And I'm going to tell you what the devil does. He causes the world to be a wilderness and he destroys the cities thereof. You can read that in Isaiah 14 and verse 16. But the message translation, don't overlook the obvious. Amen. Here, friends, with God one day is as good as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. God isn't late. Everybody say that with me. God isn't late. Amen. With his promise, as some men measure lateness, he is restraining himself on account of you. You know why Jesus hasn't come yet? He wants to save some more people. He is restraining his coming on account of the lost. And the Bible says he's holding back the end because he doesn't want anyone lost. Get this lost friend today. He has given everyone space and time to change. And I want to ask you a question and don't lift your hand up or just think about it. Would you please, for your sake? It says he has given everyone space and time to change. Is there anybody, anyone in this assembly today that will say in their heart of hearts, God, I really do need to change. I really need to change. My God, what a merciful God we're serving one who is holding back the end because he doesn't want anyone lost. Then I really like the last sentence that's in that verse, amen. It says, it says he has given everyone, everybody say everyone. everyone. Now please look at your neighbor and say, that's me. Listen, it is. He's given every one of us space and time to change. To change. How many... Husbands has promised their wife, give me one more chance and I'll change. Amen. Enough said there, moving right along. But I'm going to tell you what, it is impossible for a man to change his heart. Amen. Only God can do that. Amen. God has given everyone space and time to change. The word space means a distance. There's a space between that back wall and that front door. There's a distance. Amen. A, 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 a space is, is a distance, and we can travel too far. You can go too far. You can go too far. And then this word time, time is a measurement of living. That's what time really is. Time is a measurement of living. And you know what time's going to do? For each and every one of us, it's going to run out. Time is going to run out. We can see the evidence of this throughout the entire Bible. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, the Word of God says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. So you ain't got an excuse. Amen. That's why the writer of Hebrews, that I partially quoted earlier in this service in chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So that's interesting. You've got a way out, but you can neglect it. Amen. You can neglect what God has got for you. And it says, Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him, God also bearing them witness, both the signs and wonders and and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to God's own will. Then back to Titus chapter 2 and verse 12 through verse 15, the Bible says, teaching us, the grace of God that brings salvation that has appeared to everybody teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. And here's why we should do that, because we're looking for that appointed time looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Then Titus says this, or Paul does to Titus, verse 14, who gave himself for us. Jesus gave himself for us, that he might redeem us. That means he purchased us and bought us back from all iniquity and purifying unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And then he said, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Now, if there wasn't a space given to, uh, to someone, 
And if there, there wasn't a possibility that we could run out of time that's been allotted to someone, if it couldn't expire, then why on earth would God's Word say things like this? In Genesis 6 and verse 3, the very first book of the Bible, only six chapters deep, God said, My spirit shall not always strive with men. You know, God can quit dealing with you. I'm sure glad He didn't quit dealing with me. Amen. We try to make a deal with God, but I'm going to tell you, God is the deal. And the Bible says that my spirit shall not always strive with man. Well, that ain't what that means. Well, if it isn't, then why did Jesus say in John 6 and verse 44, no man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. Sunday after Sunday, there's that wooing of God's Spirit drawing, tugging, pulling. You can't understand why you've got that lump in your throat, that heaviness in your heart, and that tear in your eye. And I'm going to tell you why. It's because God's drawing you. And that's the only way you can get to Him. No man can come unto me. What if He quits drawing? Genesis 6, 3. My spirit won't always strive with man. The Bible says, No man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And then we hear the prophet Isaiah sounding this in the 55th chapter, verse 6 and 7. Seek you the Lord while he may be found. There's going to be somebody somewhere sometime look for God and can't find him. Call you upon him while he is near. There's going to be somebody somewhere sometime that's going to call on God and God ain't going to be near. And then it says in verse 7, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Remember the three past Sundays I preached on the message, Your thought life will affect your real life. The Bible just said, Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God and he will abundantly pardon. Jesus said in Luke 13 and verse 24 and 5, he said, strive to enter in at the straight gate. He said, for many I say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut to the door and ye, He's talking about the many of verse 24 that, that's going to seek to enter in and can't. And he said, you're on the wrong side of the door and ye shall begin to stand without and to knock at the door. Ain't that amazing? You're going to be standing without, knocking at the door. The amazing thing is they knew where the door was at. How could you knock at something that you didn't know? So they know the place to go. Just like you, you know that the church is where you ought to be. You know that the church is what you need to join. You know that God's Spirit is what you need to be born again by. But they waited too late. Many. And now they're standing at the door. They knew where the door was. They understand that they needed to be on the inside of the door. So the great truth that the Lord is dragging, or drawing home here is the fact that they knew better than what they were doing, just like a multitude today. And they stood at the door and they knocked, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Then shall they begin to say, Lord, we have eaten and drunk in thy presence, <clears throat> and thou hast taught in our streets. God, we went to the church dinners, and we heard the preacher talk about you. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Do you realize that in the New Testament there's only two places that says that Jesus stands? Every other record of the ascension of Jesus Christ, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. One time that it says that Jesus is standing is in the book of Acts whenever Stephen is stoned to death. And Stephen said, I see Jesus standing. 
I believe he was standing up, getting ready to welcome his deacon slash evangelist home. Amen. And the second time that it tells us that Jesus is standing is found in Revelation 3 and verse 20. And he's standing here today. And he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. In Luke 13 and verse 25, the lost is on the wrong side of the door knocking to get in. But you see, today Jesus is at your heart's door. Behold, I stand at your heart's door knocking. If any man will hear my voice, you see, it ain't a knock like at my door. The knock's a voice. And it's that still small voice that you've been hearing all through this singing and preaching because you ain't living as well as you know you should. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. So, let's go on a little bit further. Here's why it's so important to you and your eternal well-being to hear what the Spirit is saying unto the church. Remember those two words, space and time? In Revelation 2.21, God's Son spoke to a false prophetess by the name of Jezebel. And he said, and I gave her a space to repent. And the Bible says of her fornication, and she repented not. In Luke 13 and 3, Jesus said, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And then in Revelation 2, 22 and 23, Jesus said, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, Jezebel, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except there's a way out. They repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins of, and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. When I worked, I heard many people say on the job, all I want is what's coming to me. Well, I'm glad God didn't give me what was coming to me because I deserve hell. But because of Jesus Christ and His precious blood and His sacrifice on Calvary, I get heaven. Amen. Amen. So never doubt that all is going to get what's coming to them. And I want to say, my God of heaven, it's time for us all to wake up. It's time for all of us to realize the urgency of the hour that we're living in. I believe that it's nearing the midnight hour when all will hear the cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. And the Bible says in Matthew 25 and verse 10, And while they went, all ten of the the brides arose. Five of them had oil. Five of them had run out. They was living on fumes. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Mercy's door, as they come and get us a song, if you believe the Bible, it's going to close. It's going to shut. It's going to shut. But it's open today. I had to go to a place of business this morning. It opened at 8 o'clock. And when I got there, all the shutters was down, the door was locked, and I just, it was 8 o'clock. But then I seen them shutters begin to open up. This lady come out to the door. It's automatic doors. And she hit a latch up there. And by that time I got out of my vehicle. I walked up and I said, I'm your first customer. The door's open. But you know, in order for that door to open, I had to make the first move. 
And you see, that door didn't open until I started walking towards it. And I'm going to tell you, that's, a little, that's sort of a good analogy of salvation. You see, God made the first move 2,000 years ago, and now the ball's in your court. But you've got to move. You've got to move. And if you'll move, I'm telling you, it's unbelievable the door that's going to open to you. And I'm going to tell you what's happened in this whole service. God's been speaking to some people's hearts. I know that. But you know, you can turn him away. God says, because I called, this is in Proverbs 1 and verse 24, and you refused. You said it all, not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. He said, I also will laugh at your calamity. I'm going to mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your uh, uh, destruction comes as a whirlwind. He said, then they're going to call on me and I won't answer. But you see, he's calling you today. And I wonder what you're going to do with Jesus. Listen, it ain't about me. It ain't about these singers. It ain't about nobody but you and God. And I just want to know, what are you going to do with the Lord today? You know you need Him. You know you need Him. You know that you ain't living as well as you should. But you can. If you'll just listen to Him. He said, I've stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But you have said it not, all my counsel. Don't preach to me, preacher. And would none of my ways. Didn't want the reproof of God. But I'm going to tell you, you may not want it, but you sure in God's name need it. He's the way. This song's for you, friend. This altar calls for you. Every word that's been here today is for you. So what are you going to do with Jesus? That God that loves you. That one that died for you. Just lay them down. The one that's at your heart's door right now knocking. And you know it's him. So what have you got to lose? Yeah, think about it. What have you got to lose? What have you got to lose? What are you waiting on? Come on to Jesus. Grab your neighbor by the hand. Say, go pray with me. I want to get saved. I need help. What have you got to lose? Listen, that tear in your eye, that Just lump in your throat, that you heaviness in your heart, that's the love of God trying to lead you to repentance. That's the, the knock of God trying to get through your door. You're going to let him in? Come on. You have Hallelujah. Praise God.